Hello, health champions. Today, I'm going to talk about what happened when I ate 100 hamburgers in 10 days. And that's a lot of red meat. And according to conventional wisdom, red meat is a bad thing. It's bad for your health. It causes all sorts of problems. So I wanted to eat a lot of it and see what would happen because it has saturated fat and a lot of cholesterol. And supposedly that causes inflammation, it causes heart disease, and it causes diabetes. So I did some blood work before and after to measure these things. And we're gonna take a look at how that changed. So some of the blood work regards uh, blood glucose and kidney function. So a couple of markers here would be hemoglobin A1C, which is a measurement of your average blood glucose over a 90-day period. So it's one of the primary ways to diagnose diabetes and metabolic problems. The ideal range would be 4.8 to 5.3. That's the optimal range. Officially, everything is fine up to about 5.7, but we want to keep it a little tighter for optimal health. So before I was at 5.2, after I was at 5.3. So one tenth difference, which is not significant. That's pretty much within the margin of error. And also we wanna keep in mind that as long as it's within that optimal range, one number is not necessarily better than the other. Another thing I measured was insulin and between two and five is an optimal number. I started off at 3.6 and finished at 3.9. So again, well within that optimal range and there's not really a quality difference between these numbers. We can't say that one is really better than the other. Blood urea nitrogen is interesting. So that's nitrogen waste products from protein. So when we break down protein, we make some tissue we use some protein to make tissue, but then the excess gets turned into energy and then the byproduct is nitrogen. So if we eat a ton of protein, we would expect that number to go up. And normally it should be between 12 and 19. I started off at 16 and afterwards it was 10. And I don't know why it went that low. I would expect it to stay about the same. And it's one of the lowest readings I've had, so I don't have a really great explanation for that. But if something goes down, if we get below the optimal range, then we'd be concerned that the person wasn't eating enough. If they were malnourished or starving or something, then we'd be concerned about that. But in my case, when I load it up, then we're not worried about a low number. Also, relating to kidney function would be estimated glomerular filtration rate, which is how much the kidneys are filtering through. And a good value is between 90 and 120. I started off at 92 and finished at 99. So again, no significant difference here. And we see a couple of tenths up and down. But as long as we understand why the changes are there and what to look for, then we can tell if we need to be concerned. So if the bun, for example, had been super high, then we'd be worried if we eat a ton of protein and the bun goes up, that means the kidneys may not be filtering. But like I said, if I'm eating tons of food and it goes down, then it's some sort of variation, but we're not concerned about that. So what kind of hamburgers did I eat? Well, I ate 90 gram patties, and I'm gonna break down the details on that. With those, I would have some condiments. I eat some onions, tomato pickles. I'd put some mustard and mayo on there, maybe some ketchup, just a tiny little bit of a low sugar variety. What I like better actually is some spice. So I put some hot sauce on sriracha, on there. And the big difference though is what people think about hamburgers is typically with a bun, with bread. And I had no bun, no bread with this. And also a lot of people associate some sort of soft drink and I had no soda with these. So we're gonna compare to some fast food 
restaurants and see what a difference that make, even though they're both sort of called hamburgers. So I would also have them with a salad. And in a salad, I like to put things like lettuce, onion, tomato, avocado. I would put some cucumber, bell pepper. I love to sprinkle a little goat cheese on there. And then of course, olive oil and vinegar, plus some salt and pepper. And that's pretty much all I would put in there. Sometimes I put some seeds, maybe some pumpkin seeds, but I, I didn't do any of that because I had enough food as it was. And just to create some variety on two occasions out of 20 meals, I had some mashed potatoes and I made a cream sauce with that and also fried up some mushrooms in a pan with that. So in the blood work, we also want to look at the liver function and inflammation because we hear that too much red meat creates inflammation and too much protein is hard on the liver. So we want to see what happened. And the number one enzyme that's associated with the liver is the ALT. And a good range is between 10 and 22. Before I was at 19 and after I was at 15. So again, both are within the optimal range, but we can certainly see that it didn't get worse. We did not overload that liver in any way. Another interesting marker is C-reactive protein. It's a very popular general marker for systemic inflammation, chronic inflammation. And a good number is as close to zero as possible. We don't want it over one. If you get your blood work back and it's astronomical, like 40, 50, 60, then it's probably because you have an acute infection, which can really drive that number up. But for long term, it should be under one, ideally. And I started at 0 0.3 and I finished at 0 0.3, which is a typical value for me. So no change there. Another thing is uric acid. When people get a high uric acid, the first thing they're told is to stop eating meat because they can create some stones and gout and things like that. A good range is 3.7 to 5.5. And I was at 5.3 at first and 5.1 afterwards. So again, it didn't seem like it overloaded the liver or created any systemic inflammation either. So sometimes we get the idea that lower is always better. Like we hear cholesterol, less is always better. And nothing could be further from the truth. Some things like C-reactive protein, that's not a good marker, close to zero, the closer to zero, the better. But a lot of other things like uric acid, we need to be in a certain range. And if it's too low, then the body might be failing in some way because uric acid is a really important extracellular weight for the body to fight inflammation. So the body might actually try to make more uric acid to fight inflammation. So for the most part, less is not better we want to be in a range. So again, here we see no significant changes. So let's look at the macros to try to understand what this food is all about. So I ate 10 hamburger patties of 90 grams each. That's 900 grams or two pounds of ground beef. And I mixed 7% fat with 15% fat. So I ended up around 11. And that's just because I wanted the specific, I wanted the organic grass fed and those were the, the mixtures they came with. Normally I'd like a little more fat in there, but when you're gonna eat two pounds every day, then I try to keep the fat down a little bit just so that it wouldn't be too much food to eat. And let me tell you, that was, quite a bit of meat to eat as it was. So I didn't want to get nauseous with just stuffing myself full. So that ended up at 11% fat on average. That's about 1800 calories from the patties. And then all the other things that I ate like avocados and vegetables and olive oil would add up to about 700 calories. So I ate two meals a day, at about 2,500 
calories total. And I kept the carbs very low like I usually do. The exception where it went up a little bit was twice where I had a little bit of mashed potatoes. But other than that, it was pretty much leafy greens and onion and tomatoes. The protein was 180 grams and that was almost all from the beef. Very few grams of protein from the other things that I ate. So that might be just a few grams higher than, than that number. And the fat, we had about 100 grams from the meat, but then I also had some avocado and some olive oil, like I mentioned. So when it comes to macro calories, I had about 5% of my calories from carbohydrate, about 29 from protein, and 65 from fat. And then that adds up to 100 if you take the rounding into account. And normally though, I would recommend between 5 and 10% of your calories from carbohydrate. I think that's a long-term good way to do it. I think protein should be between 15 and 20%. So the 29 is a, a good bit higher. It is like 50% above what I would normally eat or almost twice. So that's not necessarily the way I would recommend it. And if you ate some ground beef with more fat in it and that would bring that protein down. But like I said, my goal here was to hit a certain number and that's why it ended up that way. And also then fat would be about 70 to 80% of calories normally. But now let's compare to eating the same number of calories in the form of fast food. Because that's how people usually think of hamburgers. That's, I believe, why hamburgers have a bad name. And a lot of the reasons why red meat is looked down upon. So if we had two meals from a fast food restaurant and we had, let's say, a Big Mac, one medium fries, and a medium soda. So pretty typical what people would eat. And then the second meal would be another Big Mac, medium fries, but now we finish with a small milkshake. This would give you virtually exactly the same number of calories, 2,510 calories. But when we look at the macros, then it's dramatically different. So now we have 326 grams of carbs compared to, I was between 10 and 70, and for the most part, I was probably 15 to 20. Protein was 70 grams and fat was 103. So when we look at the percentages, we got 65% of calories from carbs, we have nine from protein, and 25% from fat. But the biggest difference here, now the 326, that's over 300 grams of carbs, that's already a huge difference. But the biggest difference is that this also contains 151 grams of added sugar. And I had maybe one or two grams of added sugar through that ketchup and that wasn't even every day. So if we look at this and compare just a little bit in, in picture form, we look at the carbohydrates on my meal plan versus the fast food, we see a 13 times difference. If we look at the protein, then mine is a good bit higher. It's three times higher. Now again, like I said, I think that is unnecessarily high. Uh, I would suggest we bring that down by about a third. But at the same time, I think people eating at fast food restaurants might think that they're getting a bunch of protein, but they're probably gonna be protein deficient eating that way. And you're not getting a whole lot of meat in there. And then the question is, is it even meat? The next thing would be fat. And again, mine wasn't quite three times, but almost three times higher than the fast food. So it's kind of interesting. People associate fast food with high fat, but it turns out that's almost a low fat diet and all you're really getting is a bunch of sugar. And then if we look at the sugar, you see this little arrow down there. So the one or two or three grams of sugar that I would get 
that would barely register. It's just like a pixel thick there. Whereas the fast food would have 150 grams. So we're talking 75 times more sugar in that fast food meal. So you could have hamburgers without the sugar. You can eat all sorts of things that people associate with one way, but you just modify it to where it actually has real food ingredients. But here's the one that I bet everyone is wondering about. What happened to the cholesterol and the blood lipids? So with the cholesterol, in my book, an optimal number for a male in my age, not a teenager, not a female, but someone 50 and above, it should be between 170 and 270. That would be optimal. Now, the mainstream guideline says that less is always better and 200 is the cutoff. And that's just simply not the way it works. So the optimal for my age is 170 to 270. I had 233 before and I finished up at 199. So that's a really interesting number. I have not seen a number ever that I can recall for myself where I was under 200. And now I ate two pounds of meat every day that's supposed to have all this cholesterol and my cholesterol went down. So that just lets us know that it's not about dietary cholesterol. There are other factors. Plus, I don't even look at this number as a marker for health. By itself, I don't think that has any value at all. My LDL should be between 120 and 170, and I started at 151 and went down to 120. My HDL ideal is 55 to 75, and I went from 73 to 70. So all in all, these are excellent numbers. We're well within the optimal ranges and none of it got worse. Triglycerides is another factor we want to look at because that's the blood lipids and we think that by eating fat we're raising blood lipids, blood fats and normally we want to see it between 50 and 90. I started out at 54. My numbers are usually quite low and I finished up at 42. So again, I don't know why it went below 50, but the only time we're really concerned with a very low number for triglycerides is if we have symptoms of hypoglycemia, then that would be a problem because if we don't have enough energy for the brain and the triglycerides go down, then that number could indicate hypoglycemia. But if we don't have those symptoms, there's not really much to worry about with a low triglyceride number. So again, when it came to cholesterol, after eating 100 hamburgers in 10 days, there was no significant changes. And while macros matter a little bit, the percentages of calories from fat, protein, and carbs, it's not totally unimportant, but the food quality is even more important. And the fat that I ate had very, very good quality. So I ate only organic grass-fed beef, and it was quite inexpensive, by the way. I got it at Walmart that has a good selection. I ate avocado. That's an excellent source of fat, mostly monounsaturated. And I had mostly olive oil. Normally I eat a quite a bit of butter, but with all this meat, there wasn't really a way to put that, that butter in. And I had the olive oil on the salad. So I probably didn't eat more than maybe a stick of butter during those 10 days. Whereas the fast food restaurant, the, the food that you get from fast foods, especially, but pretty much all restaurants, is grain-fed beef. So that's vastly different. The omega-3 to omega-6 ratio. In organic grass-fed, those ratios are about a one-to-one -one between omega-3 and omega-6. In grain-fed beef, it could be 20 to one with omega-6s being high, and those are pro-inflammatory. Also, the fats that they use to cook the other things, like the fries, and they cook 
the patties themselves also, not in olive oil or butter. They use canola oil, corn oil, and soybean oil for all their cooking. And that's used for the fries, anything fried, onion rings, french fries, but also, like I said, the patties. And that's a highly damaged oil to start with. And then when they use it all day to fry things, then they cause tremendous damage to those fatty acids that were bad to start with, and then they get even worse. And here's a funny little tidbit for you. Some of you may already know that uh, McDonald's and a lot of fast food restaurants used to fry their French fries in beef tallow. That was the secret ingredient that made the fries taste so good. But then because of pressures from society, from consumers, they heard that saturated fat was so bad that they discontinued the beef tallow in 1990 and they switched to all these synthetic seed oils that cannot withstand that heat for longer periods of time without taking tremendous damage. So the tallow would actually be a fairly good thing if you're going to deep fry something. You want to use something like coconut oil or beef tallow because it's stable, it's saturated, and it can sustain a lot of heat for a long time. But now, when they stop the tallow, they had to try to get some flavor back in. So they're using what they call natural beef flavor. And anytime I see natural, in my experience, 99% of the time it is synthetic. It is made from something that you don't want to put in your body. And, but that, that brings back some of that meat flavor to it. But here's the way we want to really look at cholesterol and understand it. I said the total number of cholesterol I don't have much faith in. I don't think it has any significance for health. But here are the ones that really matter. So we want to do the LDL particle count. The higher the particle count, the smaller the particles are per milligram. And if they're small, that means that there's oxidation and inflammation that creates damage to your body and to these LDL particles. So the official guidelines say to keep that number below 1000. But again, they think lower is always better. I think that there is a very, very wide range. It's very difficult to pin down a number. So I just threw these numbers up to give you an idea that you could have a total cholesterol of, say, three to 400 and still be healthy. And then your LDL particle count would be very, very high. So that range doesn't really apply to anything, I don't think. So before, I had a number of 1222, and after, it was at 892, which again, interestingly, it's one of the lowest numbers I have ever had, even though people tell us that eating red meat will cause all this inflammation and all this damage. The other number we want to look at is the number of small LDL. Out of the total number of LDL particles, how many are small, meaning below 20.5 nanometers? Because if they're small, that means there's a lot of inflammation, a lot of damage, oxidative stress going on. And there's not an exact number because this range is so wide, it's hard to pin down a number. So I'm just throwing out my opinion which is that it should be ideally less than 20% of the LDL should be small. And here again, lower is better. There's no range that we want to need to keep it above. So I started at 350 and I ended up at 112, which is again, one of the best numbers I have ever had. Then we also measured the LDL size and the average size overall. And we want to see that between 21 to 23, closer to 23 would be better. And I started out at 21.3 and it actually went up to 21.8. And when we look at the percentage of LDL that was small, so we take this small number and we divide it by the total LDL, then again, I think that should be less than 20. 
I started out at 29 and I finished up at 13. But if there's one thing I really want to emphasize is with all these markers that I've shown you is that we don't, we want to start off with a range as an idea, but we don't want to fixate on that range. And we never want to look at markers in isolation. We need to look at the big picture. We need to relate them to the individual, to what's going on, what they've been doing, etc., in order to really understand the bigger picture. And I created a blood work course that will give you some information down below. If you really want to learn more and take charge of your health, then I believe that's a great resource. So the last thing I want to throw in, just some ideas here about ratios that are often mentioned in relation to cardiovascular health. And one of those ratios is to take the total cholesterol and divide by the HDL. And ideally, according to the textbook, you want that right at three. I would say maybe 2.5 to 5.0. And why is that? Because if your LDL, if your total cholesterol is quite high, if it's running around 300, then you could still be perfectly healthy, but you don't want your HDL to be too high. If you have a cholesterol of 300 total, you don't want your HDL to be 100. That's too high. You still want your HDL to be maybe 70 or 75, and then you would end up with a number higher, closer to five. By the same token, if your cholesterol is 225 and your HDL is too high, then that would push the ratio way, way down. And you don't want that ratio too low because a high HDL is not so good either. So mine started out at 3.2 and I finished at 2.8. So again, the three is probably the sweet spot, but it depends on high, how high your total is. Another ratio is triglycerides over HDL. So if you're insulin resistant, if you have metabolic problems and inflammation, then typically your triglycerides will go up and your HDL will go down. So a good ratio would be less than one. And I started at 0 0.8 and finished at 0 0.6. So again, one is not better than the other as long as you're in that good range. And one of the primary drivers of cardiovascular disease is insulin resistance. So one of the best markers for that is the homeostatic model assessment of insulin resistance which takes into account both how high your glucose is, but also the amount of insulin it takes to bring that glucose down. And they've set up the formula so that a good number is right around one. And if you're within a few tenths of that, like 0 0.5 to 1.5, you're perfectly fine. But if it starts shooting up, then you're becoming insulin resistant. And I started at 0 0.8 and I finished up at one. So I find it really interesting that you can eat 100 hamburgers in 10 days, two pounds of red meat every day for 10 days, something that's supposedly really bad that causes all these problems. And yet we see no significant changes on any of these blood work markers. So that just goes to show that red meat is not the evil that it's been portrayed to be. The key is to stay away from the sugar and eat quality foods. And of course, I overdid the hamburgers here because I wanted a nice round number. Normally you would just eat a moderate amount until you're full and make sure that you get plenty of vegetables, non-starchy vegetables with that. And if you want to really dig in and understand more to really master the blood work so you know what's going on with you, then I put the link down below for that course. If you enjoyed this video, you're going to love that one. And if you truly want to master health by understanding how the body really works, make sure you subscribe, hit that bell and turn on all the notifications so you never miss a life-saving video.